So now to conclude our conference today, I am so honored to introduce the Honorable Jeff Merkley, Senator from the State of Oregon, as our closing keynote speaker. We are so fortunate to have the Senator here to share his perspective on the future of housing. Senator Merkley has a long-standing career in public service, which started when he was a 19-year-old intern with Oregon's former Senator, Mark Hatfield. Later, he served as Executive Director of Portland's Habitat for Humanity. He was elected to the United States Senate in 2008 and serves on the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. Among other things, he has worked to end deceptive retail mortgage lending practices. He has led successful efforts to pass a ban on hidden steering payment that rewarded high risk and high cost home loans, and also a ban on prepayment penalties that locked out people on bad loans. We're very excited to have him here today. Welcome, Senator Merkley. Greetings, everyone. I appreciate the chance to come after you've heard from uh, many, many uh, experts. Uh, you, you probably have all sorts of ideas to carry forward. And I'll try to add a, a couple to those, although they may well have been uh, touched on in the, in the course of your earlier meetings. I wanted to uh, uh, thank Zillow and the, the Progressive Policy Institute and the American Action Forum for hosting this conference. It's such an important topic. I, I love to talk about uh, home ownership. Home ownership is a, a huge part of the American dream. You have the financial power of uh, equity, you have a stake in the success of your community, and you are king or queen of your own castle. And that sense, that sense of control of your finances and control of your space is just enormously powerful. And when I was director of Habitat for Humanity and saw people go through the transition from being longtime renters to homeowners had a tremendous impact on, on the families, on the way the parents worked with their children, on the children's view of the world, on the children's grades, the likelihood they'd go to college, huge statistics of powerful impacts related to home ownership. So it's a big piece of the American dream, as you all know. And surprisingly, the term American dream was invented when home ownership was in deep trouble. It was 1931, the depths of the Great Depression. A historian from New England, James Truslow Adams, wanted to write a book about the uniquely American qualities of Americans. He had lived abroad a, a fair amount. He had deep roots, as he put it, in the old country. And he just saw something very special about America. And so in an introduction to uh, his book he wrote that year. He said he was tracing the beginnings of American concepts, in particular the concept of that, quote, American dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each. He also wrote that this particular American concept is, and I quote, the greatest contribution we have yet made to the thought and welfare of the world. Now, he wanted to title his book The American Dream, but his editors thought nobody would buy the term. And so he didn't use it, but it became the most famous element of, of his conversation. Foreclosures were in full swing, jobs had evaporated, the stock market had crashed, families were in some cases literally starving, they were desperate, and yet he was capturing that sense that we can build opportunity and a good life for all who are willing to work. Well, Adams went on to say the following. Ever since we've been an independent nation, each generation has seen an uprising of ordinary Americans to save that dream from the forces which appear to be overwhelming it. Well, I felt in the context of the 2008 meltdown, the loss of a tremendous amount of, of, of home equity for families across the country, uh, that sense of rebuilding is very much a challenge we face. Now in 1931 and the decade that followed, Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress of that decade, they met the challenge. They passed Glass-Steagall to get banks out of high-risk investing and to focus on making loans. They created deposit insurance, stop runs on banks. They created the Home Ownership Loan Corporation, which rewrote, re replaced mortgages that were callable balloon mortgages with fully amortizing non-callable mortgages. 
They created the Civilian Conservation Corps to put people back to work. They created Securities Exchange Commission to clean up fraud on Wall Street and restore faith in investing in bonds and stocks. They adopted a minimum wage and they established Social Security to provide retirement income for every working American. It's quite a set of things that help frame the way that we as Americans today look at the world. So back to this challenge that James Adams spoke of, to save the American dream from the forces which appear to be overwhelming it. Now all of you here are involved in that effort. You're on the, the, the front line. And the question is, what can we do as members of the real estate community, the, the home building community, the mortgage finance industry, the regulatory community, and the legislative community? What can we do to help strengthen home ownership? So uh, as requested, I thought I'd throw a couple of ideas out to you all. Uh, number one, never again let the humble amortizing home mortgage, an instrument of huge wealth creation for the middle class, be turned into a predatory instrument. The key instruments in that uh, predatory strategy, teaser rates, prepayment penalties, liar loan underwriting, and steering payments to originators, bad ideas. Let's not go there again. They are largely blocked by Dodd-Frank, and they shouldn't be readmitted to a civilized society. I did number two, strengthen the incentives for first-time buyers. Now, we spend plus or minus about $80 billion a year on the home mortgage interest deduction. But very little of that goes to families of modest means buying starter homes. And the reason is very simple, and that is that the interest on a starter home doesn't exceed the standard deduction. And it doesn't exceed the standard deduction, you don't get a, a penny of help. So let's think about what more we can do on the front end to assist families. One idea I think we should pay more attention to is individual development accounts, IDAs. This is essentially a strategy where families of modest means save money towards a goal, and when they reach that goal, they receive a matching grant to help them and there are really three types of IDAs. One is for starting small businesses, and one is for gaining more education, and one is for owning a home. And the reason those three things are identified is because those are the most powerful pathways into the middle class. So let's strengthen that home ownership pathway. If 10% of new buyers each year prepared to buy a home this way and received a $5,000 matching grant in the process, it would cost a billion dollars a year. Well, that's a very small amount of money compared to the $80 billion that we're spending. So it's not an extraordinarily expensive proposal. And it would put a lot of low to modest income families into home ownership with much more stability, creating a much better setting to raise their children with more successful children, a bigger contribution to the community. And so that billion dollars becomes a profoundly valuable investment returned many times over. So let's ponder that. It is a hand up, not a handout. It has been a bipartisan idea, and it should remain so, and we should do more of it. A third idea, provide financing for families trapped in high interest loans. Of the 10 million families that are underwater, approximately 2 million fall into the category of being homeowners who are current on their payments, but they are trapped in high interest loans with no access to HARP refinancing because their mortgages are not insured by Fannie and Freddie. So let's cast them a lifeline. When these families who have responsibly made their payments at high interest rates through these difficult years of recession are able to refinance to a lower interest loan, good things happen. Because the families have lower payments, they have more disposable income and can do more for their children and generally have a higher quality of life. It's a good thing. And as they spend more in their community, because they have more, they strengthen the economy. And that's a good thing. And because their payments are lower, they become more resistant to financial blows, be it from medical debt or the loss or partial loss of a job. And so they're less likely to end up in foreclosure. And that's a good thing, and it reinforces our efforts to stabilize the prices in the, in the housing market. And if these families choose a shorter term, 15-year, lower interest rate or mortgage, not only do they pay a lot less in interest over the life of the loan, 
but they cut in half the time that they get out from underwater, which is a good thing as well. This can be accomplished in many different ways, but one of the simplest is to extend HARP eligibility to families in non-Fannie Freddie loans with an appropriate risk fee on the new mortgage. And I thought I'd just, uh, those of you who might like to look in this, look at this more deeply, I brought this, uh, that wrote last year, the 4% Mortgage Rebuilding American Home Ownership. Uh, we have some copies. Uh, Will White on my team, my, my housing policy is here, and he has copies, and you sent some copies on, there's some, at the table. some circulated around. Uh, it's on my website, so feel free to print out a copy. And if you want a short two-page commentary on it, uh, Professor Stiglitz and Mark Zandi wrote a piece in the New York Times, August 12, 2012, and basically more eloquently said about what I've just uh, said, that this would make a positive difference. The nice thing is it would actually make money for the government. So a positive program that makes money, that's very different than some of the programs that we have that maybe haven't had so much bang for the, the buck. So I did number four, rebuild a secondary market for residential mortgages. Now, that's the fancy way of describing it in street language. How do we replace Fannie and Freddie? There's a lot of caution, as there should be about this, because we cannot afford to get this wrong. If we get it wrong, Fannie and Freddie won't repay the billions that they owe the U.S. Treasury. That's unacceptable. It's a big deal. And if we get it wrong, credit for housing market will be pinched, rates will be higher, be less liquidity, less home ownership, less home building, and a big negative impact on the economy, and that's unacceptable. So we should definitely move cautiously. But I think if we're looking for a fairly strong starting point for this discussion of how we reconstruct the secondary market for residential mortgages, a good place to start is with this book, Housing America's Future, New Directions for National Policy. Uh, this was developed by the Bipartisan Policy Center's Housing Commission. And is anyone here from that group? Lori Goodman uh, served on that panel. There were 17 housing experts and uh, uh, two well-known Democrats and Republicans chairing the effort. Those were Henry Cisnero, former HUD secretary, Mel Martinez, former U.S. senator, as well as a former HUD secretary, Kit Bond, a former senator from Missouri, and George Mitchell, a former majority leader of the Senate. Now, the core principles I thought I would just mention, uh, first is we can't return to the Fannie Freddie model of private gain and public pain. Or to put that differently, private profit when times are good and an implicit government guarantee to cover the losses when things go awry. Second, a system of multiple private MBS securitizers with none allowed to be too big to fail. Third, a strong private market insurance system. This would include starting with the homeowners who are making their payments and their homeowners' equity, approved private credit enhancers. That may be mortgage insurance. It may be premium funded reserves, maybe other capital reserves. There's other ideas as well. And in addition, you have the securitizers, bondholders, and stockholders. All of those would sit in line before you ever got to a government guarantee. And the government wouldn't simply guarantee, it would have a catastrophic guarantee fund funded by G fees. Now, that guarantee drives the best possible rate and liquidity for a mortgage market. It's for middle-income Americans. And that's why so many of the plans come back to having that guarantee but placing it behind a very carefully constructed set of strategies to cover private risk in the private marketplace. And then finally, the phase elimination of Fannie and Freddie. So we don't uh, turn a switch and crash, which would be a huge mistake. There are a tremendous number of models 
out there. Uh, a Center for American Progress study laid out 22 different models and tried to summarize their differences. Uh, some make an effort to address the multifamily market, an important piece to consider. Uh, there is a question of whether or not the future structure restores funding for the National Housing Trust Fund. Uh, there is the idea of selling Fannie and Freddie through an IPO and paying off the government and just casting it adrift to do what it would want as an as a, uh, individual uh, 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 private, uh, uh, private companies. Uh, there is discussion about proprietary trading. Proprietary trading, essentially Fannie and Freddie as a for-profit private firm decided to invest heavily in highly risky securities that turned out to be underwritten or composed of primarily backed, if you will, by, by predatory uh, subprime loans. Uh, it blew up on them just as it did for so many others. Should that be allowed or not allowed? What about an industry financed database? How about eliminating the government guarantee after a transition period? You'll find that in a couple of, of the proposals. Folks who believe you can get to a, a purely private market perhaps 10 years in the future. And both Senator Isaacson and Senator uh, Corker have presented different versions of, of that. So uh, there's a lot of things to chew on, but I think this basic structure is a pretty sound place from which to examine a whole variety of individual ideas. So there you have it. Those are uh, four ideas to throw into the mix of everything else you've uh, thought about in this conference. Uh, these ideas, that is, those that you've been hearing throughout these meetings, uh, perhaps the ones I'm presenting, can help us meet James Adams' challenge to save the American dream, and in this case, the American dream of home ownership, from the forces that appear to be overwhelming it. Thank you. And I believe I i uh, have to dash out, uh, but, I can't, uh, but I have a few minutes to take questions, um, and so I can take two or three. Okay. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. We have a roving microphone over here. Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Microphone right behind you. Uh, Senator Dan Crowley of KNL Gates. There seems to be an emerging bipartisan, bicameral consensus on the need to uh, deal with FHA solvency. Could you give us your thoughts on the prospects for FHA reform? So I'm, I won't be able to give you the same sort of detail as I've been thinking about Fannie and Freddie. Uh, one of the questions that has been raised is are we going to see the same turnaround in FHA that we've seen in Fannie Freddie. Fannie Freddie have become profitable because of the underlying uh, core dynamics of the housing market. Uh, we, are, we are not yet in that place uh, with FHA. Uh, but um, uh, whether it gets essentially incorporated into this broader plan or revised that by itself, remember it was they're in that place of being specifically targeted for lower income Americans to get them into home ownership. Those goals could be rolled into this broader restructuring of our secondary market. Uh, and um, so I, I, I don't think I have a lot more to add uh, about that, but that the fundamental way they, they, they operate um, is not incompatible with doing that. And there's, there's a variety of ways you could set sub-market uh, goals uh, with, with that in mind. And uh, uh, the big draw point of FHA has been low down payments. From everything I have seen, and often you hear a, a real critique of low down payments, I lived in a world with habitat of low down payments. What I saw is those families were Absolutely, they would, they would walk through hot coals to make their payments because they, they had hold of something they weren't, didn't ever believe they'd have hold of. And I don't see in the statistics that a huge down payment greatly changes uh, ability or the willingness to make payments. So I think we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And in that context, I just want to mention, if we end up with a mortgage market 
where the core market is driven with the expectation of a 20% down payment, you can kiss goodbye homeownership for the vast number of working Americans. And so we can't let that happen. Just give us a brief, brief um, kind of outline of some of the things that you're facing from from Oregon. Uh, sure, you bet. I wish I ha we had the economic prosperity that North Dakota is uh, currently ex experiencing, uh, but we have something different. We have uh, Californians uh, have moved to Oregon. They they cashed in uh, their homes. They came up and they they built. Uh, homes uh, in uh, southern Oregon, in Medford, and, and central Oregon, in Bend, and then the housing market crashed. And because that construction was such a big part of the economies in the southern part of the state and in the central part of the state, uh, the entire um, communities crashed with them and crashed very hard. Uh, Oregon's not thought of as a sand state. But if you take those two parts of the state, very much replicated what you might have seen in parts of California, Nevada, Florida, uh, and so forth. Uh, we, our economy has been uh, a little slow to rebound, but is now growing a little faster than the national uh, average. Uh, so uh, uh, that's good. Our metro area was not, uh, Portland Metro and Eugene Metro, the big population hubs were not devastated. Uh, so um, uh, they, they, were, they were hurt, values dropped. We got, we're in that ballpark of about different parts of the state, 20 to 25 percent of folks underwater, but not the 50 percent you'll see someplace else. So the, uh, the, uh, the lumber and the timber industry uh, was very much hurt by the drop in home construction. And we not only produce lumber, we produce uh, roofing, we produce insulated doors and windows, we produce grass seed, we produce nursery stock, all of those were very much hurt by the, the drop in new home construction. So they're starting, just as the, the, the national market is starting to upturn, those industries are operating a little better. We do have a challenge uh, in terms of our local sawmills. Their access to logs has, has been caught between the high price that Asia will pay for logs and the low demand for lumber in America and they have been squeezed, and a, and a bunch of them have been shut down. Now, I, I come from a mill family. My father was a millwright in a lumber mill. Uh, he loved that job. He said, if, you know, if I do, a uh, uh, millwright is the mechanic who keeps the mill working. He said, if I do my job right, uh, everyone has a job to come to each morning, and the company makes money, and everybody's happy. Uh, and, uh, uh, but as with so many small timber towns, uh, in this case, a, a, a company bought up the local company sold the, the timber to a bigger company and shut down the mill overnight. And uh, uh, so my family was part of that uh, migration in, within the timber economy. Well, I want to thank you all very much for inviting me to come. Thank you for the work you do.